thanks for having me. Yeah, it's, it's great to be here again. I look forward to attending in person in the future. The, the Tesla Autopilot does work reasonably well in China. It, it does not work quite as well uh, in China as it does in the US because still most of our engineering uh, is in the US. And so that tends to be the, the local loop of optimization. So Autopilot tends to work the best in California because that's where the engineers are. Um, and then it, once, it, once it works in California, then uh, we then extend it to the rest of the world. Um, but we are building up our engineering team in China. And so if you're interested in working at Tesla uh, China as an engineer, uh, we would love to have you uh, work there. Uh, that would be great. Um, so um, I, I really want to emphasize this not, uh, it's a lot that we, we are uh, it, it, uh, going to be doing original engineering uh, in China. So it's not just converting um, a, a, a sort of stuff built in America to work in China. We will be uh, doing original design and engineering in, in China. So please do consider uh, Tele China if you're thinking about working somewhere. So I, I, I'm extremely confident that level five or, or essentially complete autonomy will be with, uh, w will happen. And I think it will happen very quickly. Um, I think at Tesla, we, we, I feel like we're very close to level five autonomy. Um, you know, I think, I, I, I remain confident that uh, we will have the functionality for the basic functionality for level five autonomy uh, complete this year. Um, the the thing to appreciate for level five autonomy is really um, what level of safety is acceptable for the public streets um, relative to human safety, and then uh, so is it, is it, is it enough to be twice as safe as humans? Like I I do not think that the uh, regulators will accept equivalent safety to humans. So the question is, will it be twice as safe as a requirement, three times as safe, five times as safe, 10 times as safe? So you can think of really level five autonomy as kind of like a march of nines. Like, do you have 99.99% uh, safety, 99.99999%? Nine, <laughs> How many nines do you want? Of when, what is the acceptable level? And then what amount of data is required to convince regulators that it is sufficiently safe? Um, those are the actual uh, in-depth questions, I think, to be asking about level five autonomy. That it will happen is a certainty. Yes, I, I think there are no fundamental challenges remaining for level five autonomy. Uh, the, there are many small problems. Um, and then there's the, the challenge of solving all those full problems and then putting the whole system together um, and, just, and, just, and, and just keep addressing the long tail of problems. So you'll find that you're able to handle the vast majority of, of situations, but then there'll be something very odd. And then you have to uh, have the system figure out a train to deal with these very odd situations. Um, and this is why you, could, you, you need a kind of a real world situation. Nothing is more complex and weird than the real world. Uh, any simulation we create is necessarily a subset of the complexity of the real world. So, um, I mean, we're, we're really deeply enmeshed in, in dealing with the, 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 the tiny details of level five autonomy, but I'm, I'm absolutely confident that this can be accomplished with the hardware that is in the Tesla today and simply by making software improvements, uh, we can achieve level five autonomy. I'm not sure I totally agree with dividing it into those categories, perception, cognition, and action. But if, if you do use those categories, I'd say that probably perception, it, we've made, if you say like recognition of objects, we've made incredible progress in recognition of objects. In fact, I think it would probably be fair to say that uh, an advanced uh, image recognition system today is better than almost any human. Um, even in an expert field. So um, it's, it's really a question of like how much compute power, how much, uh, you know, how many computers were required to train it, uh, how many compute hours, what was the efficiency of the uh, image training system. But in terms of image recognition or, or 
sound recognition, and really any signal. You can say, say like, generally speaking, uh, any any byte stream. Um, it, the, the 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 it can can a modern AI system uh, bend things accurately with it for a given byte stream if, extremely well. Uh, cognition. This this is probably the weakest area. If you say like, uh, is it do you is do you understand concepts and able are you able to reason effectively and can you be a creative in a way that makes sense? Um, where where because you, you have certainly uh, advanced AIs that are very creative, but they do not curate their 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 creative actions very well, and so we look at it and it's like. It's not. It's not quite right. Um, it will. It will become right though. Uh, and then action. Sort of. I think maybe if you think of like things like uh, games, uh, as maybe something part of the action part. Part of things. Obviously, at this point, uh, any game with rules, uh, AI will be uh, superhuman at any game with uh, an understandable set of rules. Like it's essentially. Any game below a certain degree of freedom level, um, so really, I'd say at this point, any game. There's, there's really it would be hard hard pressed to think of a game where, if there was enough attention paid to it, that we would not make it superhuman, a superhuman AI that could play it. Um, and that's not even taking into account the faster reaction time of time of AI. So in developing in developing AI chips for autopilot, what we found was that the, the there was no system on the market that was capable of doing inference uh, within a reasonable cost or power budget. So we, if we had gone with a conventional uh, GPUs um, and CPUs and that kind of thing, we would have needed uh, several hundred watts, and uh, we would have needed to fill up the trunk with computers and GPUs and a big cooling system, uh, which is important for range for an electric car. So we developed our own uh, AI chip, the, the Tesla full self-driving computer uh, with uh, dual system on chips with the uh, 8-bit and uh, accelerators for doing the, the dot products. Um, I think a lot of people, may, well, probably a lot of people in this audience are aware of it, but uh, AI consists of doing a great many dot products. <laughs> this is like, if you know what a dot product is, it's just a hell of a lot of dot products, which effectively means that our brain must be doing a lot of dot products. Um, so we we've, this is we still actually haven't fully explored the, the power of the Tesla full self-driving computer. In fact, we only turned on the set the second system on chip um, partially a few months ago. So uh, making full use of the the Tesla full self-driving computer will probably take us at least uh, another year or so. Um, then we also have uh, a, the Tesla Dojo system, which is a, a training system, um, and that's intended to be able to process uh, vast amounts of video data uh, to improve the training for the AI system. So uh, we've, the, the, the Dojo system, um, and, and that's like a, a FP16 uh, training system, uh, that uh, is primarily uh, constrained by heat, um, and by communication between the chips. Um, and so we're developing uh, new buses and new sort of heat re um, re uh, heat rejection or, or co cooling systems uh, that enable uh, a, a very high tera op, a very high op, <laughs> more than tera, a very high operation computer um, that, that way we'll be able to process video data effectively. How do we see the evolution of AI algorithms? Um, I'm not sure how, the best way to understand this, except that what uh, the neural net seems to mostly do is take a massive amount of information from reality, primarily uh, passive optical, uh, and create uh, a, a vector space, essentially compress a massive amount of photons into uh, into a vector space. And I was just thinking actually on the drive this morning that, you know, you like, have you tried accessing the vector space in your mind? 
like we normally take reality just for granted in kind of like an analog way, but you can actually, I think, access the vector space in your mind and understand what your mind is doing to take in all the world data. And, and, and what it is actually doing is trying to remember the least amount of information possible. So it's taking a massive amount of information, filtering it down and saying what is relevant and then how do you create a, a vector space world that, that is a very, very tiny percentage of that original data. Um, and then based on that vector space representation, you make decisions. And so it's, it's like a really a compression, decompression, uh, that's just going on on a massive scale, which is kind of like how physics is. Like you think of physics, al physics algorithms as essentially compression algorithms for reality. So that's what physics does. It, the, the, those physics formulas are compression algorithms for, rea for reality, which, which is uh, like, and this may sound very obvious, but if you simply, what, what it means is like, and, and we are the proof points of this. If, if you simply ran a true physics simulation of the universe. This would obviously take a lot of compute, but a true physics simulation of the universe, if you give it enough time, eventually you will have sentience. The proof of that is us. Um, and if, if you believe in, in, in physics and the origins of the universe, uh, we, it started out uh, you know, as, as sort of you know, quarks and leptons, and it was hydrogen for quite a while, and then helium and lithium, and then there were you know, supernovas, you got the heavy elements formed, um, and billions of years later, some of those heavy elements learned to, to, to talk. And, and so we are essentially uh, evolved hydrogen. If you just leave hydrogen out uh, for a while, it turns into us. <laughs> this is, this is, I think people don't quite appreciate this. So, so if you say like, where, where does the specialness come in? Where does, where does sentience come in? Like either the whole universe is sentient and special or nothing is, or, you know, or, maybe that's like, it's like the, you could say like, at what, at what point from hydrogen to us did it become sentient? Thank you. Uh, things are going really well at Giga Shanghai. I'm incredibly proud of the Tesla team. Uh, they're doing an amazing job and I look forward to visiting Giga Shanghai as soon as possible. Um, I've, it's, it's really impressive the work that's been done. I, I really can't say enough good things. Yeah, thank you to, to the Tesla China team. Well, we, we expect over time to use more AI and, and essentially smarter software in our factory, uh, but I think it will take a while to really employ AI effectively in a, in a factory situation. You can think of a factory as a complex cybernetic collective involving humans um, and machines. Uh, this is actually how well companies are really, um, but especially manufacturing companies, um, or at least the, the robot component of manufacturing companies is much higher. So um, now, now the interesting thing about this is that I think over time there will be um, <laughs> both more jobs and having jobs will be optional. One of the false premises in that some, sometimes people have about economics is that there's a finite number of jobs. There are no, there's definitely not a finite number of jobs. You know, an, an obvious sort of reductio ad, ad absurdum would be like, if you had uh, the populations increased tenfold in whatever a century, and uh, how, if, 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 if there were a finite number of jobs, then 90% of people would be unemployed. Um, or think of the transition from an agrarian to an industrial society where in an agrarian society, 90% of people or more would be working on the farm, and now we have two or three percent of people working on the farm. If these are the short to medium term, what is my biggest concern about growth is being able to find enough, uh, find enough humans. <laughs> that is the biggest constraint in growth. Uh, thank you for having me in, in a virtual form. I look forward to visiting physically next year. Um, and I always enjoy uh, visiting China. Uh, I'm always amazed by uh, how many smart, hardworking people there are in China, and just how just the, the, how much positive energy there is, and that people are are really excited about the future and want to make things happen. So I can't wait to be back.